dedicated and you are committed. But most importantly, we're here to learn. One of the things that I have an opportunity to do is I actually teach at the University of Minnesota. And one of the things I've also taught at the university is this. Every time I teach a class, the moment you walk in through the doors, you are making a choice to teach or to learn. Um, I want you to take that same perspective. As you've walked in here, you've given your time, you're sacrificing your family, you're sacrificing personal time to be here, and you are choosing to learn. Now, as I, as your instructor, if I am choosing, and I did choose to be here, driving all this way, I choose to be here to teach. And so you choose to learn, I choose to teach, and ladies and gentlemen coaches, we will be able to provide education and learning. And that's one of the things that we probably want the most of. How many of you would love to take from this experience at least one new thing back to your teams to make them more successful? Raise your hand. Well, we're all going to say yes, aren't we? Because we all want success in our programs. Now, let me share with you a little bit about where my success has led me today. Back when I was very young, uh, I was very fortunate to have a father who said that sports was an incredible opportunity for us as his kids, and I'm the youngest of nine, so four brothers and four sisters. He wanted all of us to be in sports, one, because he loved to watch us perform, but more importantly, he taught us that effort and hard work and being together in a team and building unity, that's what makes a team. Now, we'll learn later on about the value of winning and scoreboards and things like that, but my dad taught me some valuable lessons. Not only was I consider him my best coach, but he was also uh, one of the most important influential men in my life. And I want you to understand is that we know, and I've learned, that as a coach of 24 years, you as coaches may be spending more time with your athletes than they spend with their own family. Let's take an example of this. School starts at 7.30. School ends at 2.30. You start practice from 3 until 5. Well, you've just gotten how many? Three, four, five, about three hours with your athletes. And immediately when they go home, what do they do? They have dinner. They may or may not have dinner with their families. And right after that, they're going to go do their homework. Now, you add up all those hours together, and ladies and gentlemen, you as coaches can be some of the most influential people in their lives. Not taking apart from their family, not taking apart from anything else, but it's because of who you are, where you're at. And I truly believe in my heart of hearts that each one of us coaches are in the right place, trying to do the right thing for the right people. Now, you've brought some things with you. And I have two. One of the things I've brought is this. This is my coaching bag. As you can see, I coach wrestling. I also have coached football, rugby, and soccer. But the question is, what is in my bag? What is always in my bag? I think for many coaches, we're hoping for this. We want to win. That's why we're here. But the question is today, how do we figure out the best way to win? And through Positive Coaching Alliance, we will do our best to fill your bag, which is much information and tools that you need so that your teams can be successful. And when you walk out of here, along with myself and others, we will be able to contribute and share the best tools and instruments needed for a successful season coming. Love it. I'm fired up. I want to hear more. All right, good. Um, let's go to, uh, I guess, slide 24. Yep. And that's great. That was four minutes. That's perfect. Okay. <clears throat> um, one of the things I was actually going to do is that, and again, I, I know that Ruben, I kind of got a note from, or <clears throat> from Ruben is, you know, we, I introduced the PAL piece and he kind of said that there seems to be a tendency that CPA is maybe more on the softer side of coaching. Mm -hmm. um, I think I've gotten that from him several times from my first interview and, you know, it's not like we're, we're saying we don't want to win, but it seems like there's a very great, or not a great, a very balanced, thin balance line of that. Um, before we move on, I guess my question is, you don't want to overemphasize the win at all costs, <laughs> um, but like I pulled out a medal and saying that's part of winning, but there's more to that. Um, how f much farther do we have liberty to say about winning and trophies and medals and things like that? I think as much as you feel comfortable saying, I really, I push that point home a lot. I think okay. the reason that Ruben is um, giving you some pushback about the PAL is because he's national and he hears the national pushback from partners. 
And the critique before the partners know anything about Positive Coaching Alliance is my coaches aren't going to go for this. They want to they want to join the Winning Coaching Alliance. They don't want to join the Positive Coaching Alliance just based on the name. So I think when Ruben's giving you advice on that, the, a lot of the first impressions of audience members is we're all about trophy giving participation trophies. We're all about everybody's a winner. You don't have to keep score. That's sort of preconceived notions of a lot of people coming into our workshops before they've even heard it. So I think that's where he was kind of hesitant about the whole idea of POW. Um, but I like, I mean, that's one of the things I hit home to is, you know, I'm a competitor, we're competitors, National Advisory Board's competitors, we all like to win, I'm even competitive at yoga, you know, like things, I, I push that hard that, you know, the people that are involved in this company are some of the most competitive people out there. And the research that we found is not just to make you warm and fluffy and huggy fuzzy, it's to make you better competitors, which will increase your score on the scoreboard. So that's yeah. one of the things I hit home hard with coaches because bottom line is, Everybody wants to win on the scoreboard. We all want to win on the scoreboard. That's our goal as coaches, but yeah. both and. It's not you have to do one without the other. Being win at all costs, that at costs part is really important. Being win, focused on the win, that's okay. But how you get to the win, the process of effort, learning, embracing mistakes, that's what's more important. But the goal is to get to the win. That's why also the double goal coach model, what's the first circle? Uh, of a double um, goal coach. What's the first goal of a double goal coach? Uh, winning. Uh, <laughs> I can't remember. Striving to win. Striving to win. Striving to win. Yeah. So the Venn diagram is a double goal coach has two goals. The first goal is striving to win. The second goal is teaching, teaching life lessons. Life. What we want is both to happen. Right. And if you had a choice between one or the other, teaching life lessons would always rise above. When it all costs, coaches know teaching life lessons are important, but when push comes to shove, that what's going to be most important is winning. So, it, you know, that's, that's where the balance is, but we intentionally put striving to win as the coach's first goal. Right. So does that answer your question? It does. Because um, one of the things that I was going to do is that, um, you know, our, our – uh, well, bringing out – so we're in Minnesota, right? So – my daughter's actually been lucky enough to be on a state championship team and a runner-up team. So I was actually going to bring her medals uh, and have them, you know, just show them because not many coaches have blue state championship medals. So I was actually going to pass them around and said, how many of us would like to win these for our athletes? Um, also, too, is even actually bringing a first-place Minnesota state championship trophy, mm -hmm. which is big, you know, with their picture on it. Um, but I didn't know if that was kind of overemphasizing it or. Um, well, where would you go from there? Well, so again, just like I pulled out a, a small metal from my bag, I would actually pull this back out and raise it above my head and say, how many of us would love to have our athletes participate or be a part of a state championship team holding this trophy? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, as a coach, I resonate with that. Yeah. I mean, we all times do. you see state champions always raising their trophy above their head, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And, it would say, and if I can get one, I would actually say, it would say Minnesota State, or Minnesota State High School League State Champions. Mm -hmm. And as coaches, you know, we all dream about getting a state championship. So mm -hmm. I would, so basically what I was saying, I would actually bring medals that, from first place championships, and then also a big trophy, or some type of trophy that could be held up, big enough that I could actually put it up above my head. Mm -hmm. So... And then what would you do though? And then what would your next line be? Well, again, it'd be the same thing I said is that, you know, we all want, how many of you would, would all want it, your athletes to be a part of something like this? Well, they all would. Well, we want that as well, but we're also going to share with you how striving to win and teaching life lessons go hand in hand. And even the fact that teaching life lessons along the way will increase all aspects of your team, which will get you more championships. That's what, that's the key right there. I think that example is great as long as you wrap it up with that point right there. Because you're gonna keep coaches still involved and, and you're gonna you're gonna address the role of winning. We want this to happen. The way this is going to happen, you know, the, the people think the teaching life lessons takes away the winning. The teaching of the life lessons, the kids that have integrity, persistence, resilience, teamwork, communication, all of those life lessons are actually gonna increase the number of wins on the scoreboard. Okay. I think that's I think that's a great point to hit home. Okay. So then that challenges me then, so I just said that, right?
But then um, slide number 14, right, talks about those that focus on the scoreboard and those that focus on mastering. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to confuse the fact that, wait a minute, this guy just said I can win more championships. If by, you focus on mastery. Right. Mm -hmm. So versus, again, that notion of like, well, scoreboard winning, scoreboard winning, scoreboard winning. So. Um, I mean, I think the point is, is that it's when you talk about mastery versus scoreboard on that slide 14, yeah. it's how do you define success? It's that's what it's called defining. It's defining how does your team define success? How does your team define winning? And what we're trying to do is re, really give a different definition of winning. Winning and success is not solely because of the scoreboard. Scoreboard right. focus coach on that slide that has it on slide 14. Those yeah. are teams that are completely win at all cost, only focusing on the scoreboard. That's how they think. We're talking about focusing on mastery. Your definition of winning is the mastery definition of winning and the mastery definition of success, meaning my team is successful, my player or whatever, is successful if they give 100% effort, if they've learned something, and if they know how to embrace a mistake and bounce back from it. So right. I think the line there that, that is just always crystal clear for me is if you're a win at all cost coach. Right. Which would you guess, would you say that over 50% of the people attending are in some way, shape, or form? It depends where, where I am. It depends on the team and where I am. A lot of times, and I'll ask the partner three days before I do the workshop, I'll call the partner and I'll say, where do you think your coaches stand in terms of win at all costs? And they'll tell you. Some of them will say, oh no, our coaches are great. They know that it's the youth program, they're really developmental, they're really working on sales. Other ones will say, oh, they're all win at all costs. You've got your work cut out for you. You know, so it depends. But, but I think the crystal clear way to differentiate those two are that if you're a win at all cost coach and you've just won a game and your players have not given maximum effort, they have, you know, been nasty to each other and they still came up with the win, are you satisfied? A win at all cost will say, yeah, we won the game. I don't care how they played. I don't care if they played like crap and they, hurt, they were terrible to each other. We won the game. That's important. Whereas a mastery focused coach will say, you know what? Win or loss, you guys didn't play your best out there. You guys didn't treat your teammates with respect. You guys didn't, you guys were beating yourselves up after mistakes. So that's where the focus comes into. Are you happy when your team wins, even if they didn't put the best effort in? Yeah, deep inside, you might be like, yeah, it was a good game. It was an easy one. But as a coach, that's not what we want. That's not our goal. Okay. So thank you for that little tangent. No problem. <laughs> All right. Um, so let's move down to 24. Okay. All right. Ready, begin. Go. So the next slide you'll see, we have uh, three softball players. Um, can anyone tell me what they know about this picture or do you recognize it? Um, I heard about it a couple years ago about a girl that hurt herself in a baseball game and the other girl from the other team picked her up and, I don't know, carried her around back to home plate or something. I don't know much about it. Well, thank you, Coach Kelly. You've added a lot already. Uh, you were definitely right about this aspect. And what this really is going to tell us is that it's going to show us really as a coach, where would I like to, my athletes to be um, when it comes to the state of mind of playing the game? And so uh, right now we're going to watch this video. And as you watch this video, I'd actually like you to look at three things. Um, number one is what is actually the environment? What kind of coaching environment do you think is going on? Number two is when you see the, what happens, um, what would be your first reaction as a fan? And the third one is if you saw this, when you see this happen, what would be your reaction as a parent? So again, recognize the environment, take a re reflection back on how you'd react as a fan, and then take a reflection how you'd act as a parent. We'll watch the video now. Okay. Okay. Um, all right, so let me get a couple of responses. I'd asked you the environment. Uh, Coach Kelly, what did you see in the environment? It seemed pretty tense because I heard it was a playoff game. So it seemed like a pretty, a pretty competitive game going on. Yeah, you're, you're, definitely, you're definitely right. It was one of those things that it meant a lot to both teams. Um, let's see. Uh, hey, Coach Kelly, uh, yeah. what was your reaction? Uh, how what would your action be if you were a fan watching this game and what you saw? 
Um, it depends what team I'm on. I think if it was the, if I was on the team of uh, the girl that hurt herself, I would definitely like Sarah Chikulski, I think I would be thrilled. I'd be excited. I'd be thinking, wow, those girls are great. That's so sweet that they did this. Um, and we still have a chance to win the game, even though we, you know, we're going to get those points for that home run. But I think if I was on the opposing team, if I was on Mallory's and Liz's team, I would be like, what are they doing? What are they thinking? You know, it's part of the game. She got hurt. That's tough luck. That's how it works. Most definitely. I think you're right. And I think it's one of those things that we're in the moments. We have different perspectives. And I think that's one of the key parts of this video is looking at the different perspectives from all different places. Now, whether we're on the winning team or the other team that uh, may be uh, losing, let me ask you this. Uh, Coach Kelly, when you watch this, if that, if you were a parent of one of those athletes, what is your reaction to that? I think no matter what, I'd be extremely touched as a parent. No matter what team I was on, I would just be just so impressed by those young ladies. Excellent. Excellent question and, or answer. And I think it's one of those things that I myself as a coach, um, I can recall a, a similar situation like that that happened in one of the wrestling meets that I was with. And it really was one of those things that, as a coach, I couldn't have felt more proud. As a father, I couldn't have felt more proud. But most importantly, the human spirit was raised up and uh, given hope in an auditorium that was filled with people that, regardless of winning or losing, we were able to see probably the highest, most excellent version of sportsmanship that you could ever imagine. So that's what we're trying to do here at PCA. We are trying to get you and your athletes and your team and everyone involved, both fans and parents, to realize that if something like that would happen, that the same reaction would be duplicated. Because we can all admit that there's not enough of those examples in our sports world, in our sports media today, versus the other ones that are more negative. But thank you so much for participating. Well, one of the things we want to do is that that is a perfect example that leads into who we really are as PCA. If you think about it, we really have this next slide. Um, we're going to do principle three, honoring the game. Now, as you can see, that is a tree. Um, who knows a little bit about a tree? What are some things you notice there? What are your observations, Coach Kelly? Um, it's got leaves and branches and a trunk and roots. Roots. Um, why do you think, anyone here, why do you think we're going to focus on the roots versus the trunk or the branches or even the leaves right now? Why roots? What, what, what's important about that in a tree? Coach Kelly? I think they hold the tree in place. Good. They not only hold the tree in place, but they also provide it a stability and a foundation, and they provide nutrients. Without a good foundation, your tree will never flourish. Your tree will not be able to stand up in the worst of storms. But most importantly, your tree will not be able to sustain itself. So that's why we believe in using this metaphor in honoring the game is we're going to be using the word roots. And that word roots is actually going to turn into an acronym. So if you look at it, um, how do you spell roots? Well, R is for rules. O is for opponents. O is for officials. T is for teammates. And ladies and gentlemen, what does S stand for? Mm. Self? That is right, self up there. And we're going to talk about all those aspects. Nobody ever guesses that one, by the way. They always have trouble with that one. Really? For some reason. <laughs> Even when it's on the screen? Well, no, before you show it, if you because you can click it. When it's just an S and you ask people to think of the last one, they always have trouble coming up with that one. Oh, I'm sorry. Actually, I had this, I had the, I already got to the. Oh, okay. When you do it on the live slideshow, though, it has an S and then it's blank. Gotcha. All right. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, let's look at the first part. Um, rules, as we look at it, uh, the value and importance of rules. One of the things that we'll see is that we all have to follow them regardless of rule whatever sport you might be in but one of the things that sometimes happens is some coaches or some sports tend to try to bend the rules um, they try to ignore the rules um, in order for victory um, and we feel at pca that the most valuable part is to honor the rules in all aspects in all ways shapes and forms um, let me just ask a quick question uh, if you think about your past competition how many of you could maybe say you've observed where rules were not honored in a game? Raise your hand. Okay. Um, Coach Kelly, how did that make you feel when those rules were not being honored and you were trying to honor them? Um, I felt cheated out. 
I've had teams that have kept more players on sides or off sides than they should have. And as a developing program, it was tough to teach my girls the right way when the other team wasn't upholding those rules. Exactly. So the counterpart to that is when someone is not following the rules, it makes a great opportunity for us as coaches to teach a life lesson. Mm. Um, but also we're the recipients of sometimes maybe them getting away with something else. But the value of this is that um, how many parents do we have in the audience? Good. Um, how do you feel when your kids follow your house rules at home, Coach Kelly? Love it. Right. And why do you love it? Because it keeps order. It, it makes things make sense. I don't have to get on their case. They just know what to do. Good. I've noticed the same thing. I'm a father of four children. I have a 20-year-old, an 18-year-old, a 15-year-old, and a 12-year-old. Yeah. We have rules in our home, and we have rules in, the, in our competitions. But the one thing I've noticed this is when you follow rules, two things happen. Number one, there is organization and there is structure. But number two is that following the rules is a matter of respect. And when that respect is obtained, it's one of those things and honored, everything goes much, much easier. So yeah, my four kids, when they are honoring the rules at home, they're honoring me, they're respecting me, and they're respecting the house. Now, we can say the same thing at PCA, we wanna do the same thing, that we wanna make sure that our first understanding is that we as coaches, we as parents, we as fans, need to honor the rules. The next letter is for opponents. Um, let me ask you this, if I have my son who's a wrestler, um, he goes undefeated, 20 wins and zero losses, but every one of his wrestlers has been maybe a mediocre wrestler, versus he has a record of 15 wins and five losses. And the five people that he lost to were actually people that were placed higher in state than him or were ranked higher. Which one of the two do you think my son will learn the most from? The one where he got 20 and 0 with no much, not much competition or the one where he suffered five or six losses because the competition was at his equal if not better? I think the second one. How many of you would want your athletes to have that challenging competitor before they actually reach the championships? Raise your hand, right. Mm -hmm. So therefore, what we believe at PCA is we need to honor our opponents. We need to understand and respect them. It's one of those things that uh, they're not our enemy, um, but they're an opponent. And I can say for my part is that I want my athletes to find the best opponents they can before they reach the sections, before they reach the championships. Because in all regards, it's one of those things that they need to understand that comp their opponents actually are the, are the best tool for them getting better. I'd like to move on as well as to officials. Officials are ones that really do make a difference. Do they make a mistake? Yes. Are they perfect? No. But are, do we make mistakes as coaches? Do we make mistakes as, uh, um, in the game? Yeah, we do. But the reality is, is they are human. The reality is, is they need to understand who they are and what they're trying to do. The reality is, is we may disagree with them, but we need to honor them. They're doing okay, something that we need to do. Hold on. Yeah. Hi, sorry to interrupt. Um, we have this room here. Yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay. No worries. Um, where was I? So um, <laughs> we need to understand and put our place our, ourselves in a place that when we honor officials, is a reflection of ourselves, of our team, and of our athletes. And one of the biggest things I can do, I can honestly tell you in all my 24 years, I have definitely seen officials that have done terrible jobs. But the reality is, is they're doing the job, not me. I need to honor them, I need to trust them, and let them know through my verbals and my non-verbals that I may not agree with them, and I can have conversation with them, but I have to honor their rules, and we have to honor their decisions. Next, I'd like to move on your team. Um, this is pretty much as simple, as easy as you can make, make it. T is for teammates. If we are able to work with our teammates, we are willing to help them understand a way to respect them. If I can respect my teammates and they can respect me, it's an easy philosophy. I share this in my coaching. Your success is my success and my success is your success. And in doing so, we can all find a way to make our teams even better. And to finish up, I wanted to share with you self. Once it's the, we get to the point of who we are, we've respected the rules, our opponents, our officials, and our teammates, we need to not forget who we are. When you can look in the mirror and say, I will do my best and I walk off this field or walk off this field of competition with everything I can, it'll be one of those things that's saying, I have done my best. When we strive for excellence, 
and it is shown, then our teammates trust us, our officials, officials respect us, our opponents will revere us, and we, in a sense, will be striving for what we really want to do. We're going to try to win and strive for winning all we want, but we also want to learn life lessons in the process. And when we can learn those things together, we definitely have a foundation that will carry us through the rest of life, known as roots. Nice. All right. Nice okay, one second. Yep, go ahead. We need to move. Okay, that's fine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, what do we got? No, you, what I was going to say is you still have um, like four minutes left, three to four minutes left. Okay. And what I, if you're going to do the same principle, I would probably keep going because the culture creation slide is next. Yep. Um, and that's really a great way to kind of wrap up all the principles, especially honoring the game, the culture creation. Sure. Slide. And then the next one, slide 29, is a toolkit for the honoring the game. Section. Yeah. So it's nice to bring in some of the tools um, as part of your examples as well. And as I said, you have time to do it. You weren't. Your pace was fantastic, so I wouldn't worry about you know timing. You'd have plenty of time yeah. to finish those last two. And even the slide, even the next slide is you know talking about your Mallory moment. At some time as coaches, you're going to be challenged, um, and you know will you make the right decision? You're going to have a Mallory moment. So I would definitely you know try to work in those three in there as well, rather than just cutting it off right at the end of the um, five areas. Okay, I was just looking at my time that we started at 11.30. And I, right. I paused it when we were chit-chatting in between. Oh, okay. <laughs> I wanted to give you a true 20 minutes. I didn't want to cut you off because you were asking questions. Okay, so do you want me to continue on then? What would you say? Do you want me to keep going then? If you want to, or, I mean, that's fine. If you, wanted to, if you want to try that part out too, that's great. Okay. Um... So it would just be basically after you got finished talking about self. And then the next one just goes into the importance of culture. Okay. All right. Um, Are you okay? So, okay. Yeah. Okay. It's been, it's been one of those what? days. You're the perfect PCA trainer with all these crazy things coming at you, and you're like, game on. I love it. Welcome to the world right. of being a PCA trainer. Right. Okay. Um, so as you can see, the next slide. Um, actually, Kelly, can you read that for me, please? Yes, it says um, culture, importance of culture creation, and culture is the way we do things here. Great. Um, just out of curiosity, can someone give me a, an idea? I'm looking for three individuals to share something quick. When, when the word culture comes to your mind, what's the first word that comes up? I need three volunteers. Yes, you. Um, culture is just how, like the, the reputation of the team, how the team does things. Okay, reputation, great. Uh, two more. Two more volunteers. Yes, um, you. Attitude, attitude and behavior. Great. So we've got reputi or reputation. Um, we have attitude and behavior. Um, one more. Come on, we can do it. Um, I know you can. What the coach, what the coach allows us to do on the team, the coach's rules, how they handle things. Great. Um, we as coaches understand that you engage in all those things. You as coaches are literally responsible for the culture. You are the culture keeper. Um, being able to bring an environment uh, that is lear a learning environment, an environment that is a safe environment, an environment that allows your athletes to see that they're in a good place. It's one of those things that's not always easy, um, but it's also one of those things that I've learned from my own personal experience is that once those athletes arrive in my room or arrive on the court or arrive on the field, I need to do everything I can to create an, a culture that is going to be inviting and a culture that's going to be learning. And 
just as you came in here earlier tonight with a choice to learn, and I'm making a choice to teach, we are creating our own environment. <laughs> One of the things that we understand is that, you know, sometimes there's this win at all cost mentality in professional sports. But what that doesn't do is that sometimes it doesn't filter itself all the way to youth sports. And when we think of youth sports and what that means, um, think about the youngest of grades. What's the number one thing that they want to have during their sport, during their practice, during their competitions? The one fun thing, the one thing they want to do is what? Have fun. We let her <laughs> fun, right. What's happened is that our culture has slowly changed from the professional sports all the way down. Well, one of the things we need to do is that in part of honoring the game is being able to create a culture. We all have cultures even in business. We have cultures in our, our homes. We have cultures in our uh, communities. But the question is, what kind of culture are you creating as a coach? One of the things that's just important to think about is when you think about the opportunity you have, and remember I said at times some coaches may spend more time with their athletes than the athletes spend with their own families or, or their own parents. And so when it comes down to it is, are you creating a culture that says excellence? Are you creating a culture that says success? Now, you'll read at the bottom, it says culture, the way we do things here. It's a phrase that we're trying to literally create and create a revolution around because when your athletes are doing something that's positive, you can reinforce that by saying, that's just the way we do things here. We're honoring the game. We're honoring our um, opponents. Um, we're being respectful in all ways, shapes, or forms. But yet at the counterpart, a way to teach a learning aspect is if maybe your athletes do something that maybe needs to be corrected. They make a mistake when it comes to the roots and the foundation of the culture you're trying to create. Then you can introduce and say, I'm sorry, that's not the way we do things here. And then give them an opportunity to learn and for an opportunity to teach the way the culture is and I know each one of us in this room we want nothing but the best for our athletes and I know as parents I want nothing the best for my my students or my um, young people but when we come together and we create a culture that is nurturing and caring at the same time striving to win striving to learn striving to grow we can definitely say in unison that's just the way we do things here all right. Well done. Thank you. Awesome. Take a deep breath. <laughs> Sit down in one place. Relax. Yeah. <laughs> well, I appreciate you. I mean, that was great. As I said, it's a perfect training for being a PCA trainer because sometimes we have crazy trips to places and we walk in the door and things aren't as expected and you know, things are happening all around, and then they're like, okay, you're ready to go in five minutes, right? And you're like, ah. right. so, you, you know, it's game time. You pull it all together somehow. You did a, you did a fantastic job. I am, um, I'm Thank really you. impressed with your pace of things. Um, you put in a lot of information and a lot of things, and your pace was fantastic. I don't think you were rushing, but I think you got in every single thing that you needed to. And uh, you can tell you're a, a seasoned teacher because, you know, your, your facial expressions and the way you ask questions and all that stuff, it's very engaging. So I think you did a super job at that. Um, Thank you. I love the way that you talked about education and learning and, and, you know, just asking permission to teach and asking permission for them to learn something. I think that's really great right off the bat. I really liked that. And I like the way you brought in, you know, your personal story. Just saying, you know, I'm a, I'm a college professor and a college coach. Yet when I, I was the youngest of nine, and this is what my father taught me. I mean, I think that's even just that that trajectory of life right there earns my respect to listen to you. Like this kid was the youngest of nine. I mean, just being that and, and being athletic, and you could just imagine how your culture was growing up in that environment. So I think that's that was really awesome. I love. I always bring up the point to again being a teacher. I tell a lot of uh, parents. I used to tell parents that you know uh, sometimes I'm spending more time with your child than you are. And that was just as a yeah. So I think that's a really great point to bring up, that these coaches are influential, not only because of what they do, but because of something as simple as time, the amount of time they're spending on the, on the field. And uh, I know that's definitely now as the mother of four and two of them being high school students, I feel like I'm not seeing my kids as much right now. And I'm like, what's going on? I haven't seen you in three days. 
and they're spending a lot more time with their coaches than with me. So I think that was a great point so, to bring up. So, you know, because I only emphasize just the practice piece. I mean, if, again, I'll go back to wrestling. So we practice from three to five, mm -hmm. uh, Monday through Thursday. Then we mm -hmm. have a competition where we leave school at three. We don't get back until 10. Mm -hmm. And then the next Saturday, we usually have a tournament. So that mm -hmm. starts at nine o'clock and goes till four o'clock. Yep. Um, so would it be too much to even kind of talk about even just, because that was just the practice schedule, mm -hmm. to even go even more of like, let's think about our competitions. Um, I could actually probably figure out actually how many hours I spend with my athletes in one wrestling season. I think it's cool. I mean, I think it's a neat statistic because a lot of times we don't think about it. Um, you're yeah. going to be talking to a lot of youth coaches which might only have one night of practice a week or two nights of practice a week. So and then one game. Yeah. that's really great if you're talking to like high school coaches, but a lot of these or club coaches, but you just have to be aware. Sometimes the biggest struggle that the youth coaches have are not enough time with the athletes. That's right. one of the problems they have. Like how do I teach all this stuff and get in these life lessons and do all this great stuff. And I have them for two hours a week. So right. it's another end of the, another edge of the sword, but I thought okay. that was I love the way you pulled out your coaching bag because we always talk, I talk about that all the time. We talk about that at PCA that we're going to give you tools for your bag. So I love that you actually had your bag there. And the first thing you pulled out was a medal. I think that's great. It might be a lot to lug around, you know, a laptop, a projector, a bag, and a trophy. <laughs> that might be a little tough to carry that around. So I think your, your story about winning would be just as strong with a medal as it would be as the, you know, I think it's cool to have a trophy, but it might be a little bit to lug around. I don't know if that's... Yeah. But I do like the point. I think even just hand holding up your hands, you know, you can visualize what that is without having to have a trophy yeah. there. But I love the idea. I think it's very creative. Um, okay. You just the whole the whole time you were conversational and asking questions, but every single time I gave an answer, as you know, the huge audience that you had, um, mm -hmm. you know, you always said that's a great answer or, or good job or I like the way you're thinking about that. And as I said, as a teacher, that comes naturally to you, but that's not always a natural skill that people have. So I think that that makes me want to answer. More, it makes it a safe environment to answer questions, which gets definitely more interaction in your workshops. Um, the one part you were talking about, um, how, and I'm not, I'm not sure if I missed it, but you were saying um, after the Mallory Moment video, you said, yep. um, and, and let me tell you, you know, as a wrestler, as a father of a wrestler or whatever, you know, there was the most amazing story that happened, the most amazing thing that happened in wrestling, and I was waiting for you to tell me the story of what happened in wrestling, right. and you didn't. So I was like, well, I didn't. You said, you know, I've had some proud moments as a father, as a coach um, in, on the wrestling match. And I was like, what was the story? So that was one where I feel like if you have a great story to tell, tell it. Okay. Because I want to hear what happened. <laughs> the curiosity in me was like, he just dropped it. He didn't tell that story. And that's, what I, that's where I want to hear it because these stories that you tell on the slides are something that yep. we show nationally. But when you can take a real moment that happened to you or another player or another game that you saw, that's where I think it's it's great for people. And I've even asked, has anybody had a Mallory moment? You know, and it's neat to hear from the coaches in the room. Have you ever had an athlete do something that you just went, wow, I am so proud to coach them right now. I'm so proud right. that it is on my team. And it's, right. it's really neat to hear stories, even at six and eight years old. These coaches say, oh, gosh, yeah. I had a kid that's – I had one that said the six-year-old asked the ref if he could stop the game because the guy that he was marking in soccer couldn't get his shoe tied. And he asked the official if he could stop the game so this little boy could go over and tie his opponent's shoe in a double knot. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's not ESPN worthy, but that's such a cute Mallory moment where this kid honored his opponent. And I thought that was really neat. Um, I just – what else did I – I have a lot of great things. Um Again, I love it when you just talked about the rules of your house, the culture of your house. That's making a connection right there to me. Why is, why is it important to have a culture? Or why is it important to have rules, organization, respect? I thought that was great. Um, I loved, and permission to steal, the idea of asking the coaches, what would you rather, or even parent at a parent workshop, what would you rather have? Somebody that wins 20, zero, you know, 20 wins, zero losses, or 15 wins, five losses. I think it's something we all know in our heads, but until you articulate that, as parents, you want your kid to win every single match, every single game. But right. in the life lessons part of it, part of it, what would he learn more from? I think I think that's a fantastic point to bring up in almost any workshop, even in the athlete workshops. I think it's great, right. especially for parents. I would definitely uh, put that story in there. That's great because as coaches, I don't know if many coaches will say, "Yeah, you know, it'd be better for him to lose five matches." You know, as a coach, you know, it might be, "Yeah, I know that in my mind, but we want to win them all." So. Well, and, and again, I try to resonate in the sense of, you know, I, you know, before the championships, you know, you have 
and again, I have to be careful because I could talk a lot about my experiences, but you know, one of the things that we just, here's a perfect example. Um, Mound is a team that uh, plays right next to us. Um, and they got put into a different division for football mm -hmm. and they went eight wins and zero losses mm. the whole season. So here's the backstory. That team has been so bad that that eight wins that they had this year is more wins combined than they've had in the last four years previously. Mm. So what happened was they got put in a division where they were the best and they were um, uh, beating teams every week over and over. And they were being compared to teams like us that were playing a, a, a section up and they were being compared to other teams who were undefeated. They even got ranked in state. Um, they played their first playoff in, in, in the last 12 years. They're 8-0. and They play the first playoff. They have to play a team that is, um, I think they were four wins and five losses. Okay. Or they were 500. They lost to that team in the first round of sections. Wow. So that's a perfect example is that they went the whole season without playing anyone tough. Right. And they played a team that was mediocre tough, and they lost. Yeah. And, and I just compare that because I've lived it. We beat that team 54 to 0. Hmm. So if, if Mound had been in our section, they would probably have a losing record. Yeah. But it's one of those things that uh, did their team get better because they never lost, only to lose in the, in the, in the section championships. Yeah. I'm the guy who says, you know what, give me a 500 team where I know that we've been playing the best teams in the state and that we've held our own. Yeah. Um, so anyway, it's just one of those things that I am the coach that would – I want a couple of losses before I go to sections because – I know that we've gone through those losses mm -hmm. and you do not need your first loss in the first round of sessions to go to state. Yeah, I agree. I remember my high school coach would always put two scrimmages at the beginning of the season and they were the toughest two teams in our area. And we didn't even play them in the league. And we were always like, why are we starting the season off playing the toughest two teams every year? It was like, oh, you know, we're going to get crushed. And she did it every single year. And, you know, and yeah. that was the reason. She wanted you to start by playing a tough team, playing a tough competition. And we were always like, gosh, we're going to lose our confidence right away. But it, it, was, it was very strategic. It was a great idea. So it's a very nice job. I thought you did a great job, too, explaining each of the, you know, R-O-O-T-S. You didn't spend too long on anyone. You had some quick, good points. Um, I, thought it was, I thought it was excellent. Your, your terminology was flawless. I mean, you had everything. There was nothing that you said that I was like, yeah, PCA doesn't really feel that way. I mean, you are right in line with everything. And, and that, that's a lot of times is what I do, especially for new trainers. Sometimes the terminology is wrong or you'll say something like, oh, we at PCA believe. And I'm like, yeah, that's not really what we believe. <laughs> but, you know, I didn't find anything in what you said that was any way, shape or form off of what PCA believes, which is awesome because that means you're living it. If you, if you can say it that quickly and that much, that's great. Um, mm. I love that, you know, the culture, when you're talking about culture, um, I talk about culture keepers a lot. I think it's great to bring up that the coaches, you are the culture keeper. It's just a quick, coaches will remember that. It's kind of like a quick sticky word. Um, and I go one step further after telling the coaches that they're culture keepers. If you can't do it alone, appoint people. That's one of the tools. But appoint someone to help you be the culture keeper because you're only one person or you're only, you know, two or three assistant coaches maybe. So have people help you, especially when you're talking to youth coaches. Youth coaches are lucky they have one coach. So appointing a culture right. keeper is really important when you've got, you know, mom or dad volunteering on the sidelines and nobody else around to help. So that's helpful that way. Um, and again, I think if just when you were talking about at the end about the, the trickle down of the wind all cost professional attitude towards youth, that's something else that really sticks with people. They understand what's driving their behavior, what's driving the craziness and the, and the crazy emotions on the sidelines is that the idea of professional sports is trickling down. So I love how you brought that home. I also think it's great the way you talked about, you know, you now have the language. And when you gave examples of this is the way we do things here, and you, you just kind of walked us through that. That's so important because a lot of the things we talk about in PCA, yes, we want you to know the principles. We want you to know the theories. However, if you can't articulate it to your team, it's just going to die flat in the water. So we want you to be able to have the terminology to be able to use these 
you're not honoring your opponent. You're not really honoring the team here. Are you honoring yourself? Or that's not the way we do things here. It's great to give coaches and parents and athletes the words to use. So I thought that was really great the way you brought that up. Um, and that's, that's the end of my notes. I thought you did a fantastic job. Dead's going to be okay. jumping for joy. Oh, good. Well, still got some things to work out and mm -hmm. kind of get the flow a little bit, you know, so, I mean, it's, it's been nice knowing you and getting comfortable with you. And so, uh, and obviously, I thought, you know, we we're supposed to, I think, have some observers possibly yeah. during these times, right? Yeah, so but that's okay. Would have been a little different, I think, if I knew people were actually watching me and so, but. <laughs> Well, get rid of your nerves. Just like, it's just good to go through it. You know, I think it's just the more times you can go through it, the better. Right. So I think you'll do great. Now, did you want to um, demonstrate any of this in Spanish? You were asking. You know, um, yeah, I would. I would love to be able to maybe be one of your other tools. Okay. Uh, obviously, I'd have to, you know, be familiar with this and um, be able to get some feedback from other folks. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I'd, I, I'm definitely open to expanding myself and challenging myself to mm -hmm. see if I could do this in Spanish. Okay, well it's up to you. I mean, if you'd like to do it with an audience with Deb there, um, you know, you're welcome to even do a portion of it or do your intro in Spanish maybe and you know, just to get the people in Minnesota that feel that you can do this, um, you know, which is okay. always good too. If you want to do it at a later date, that's fine too. Okay, I guess, um, Part of me says I'd love to do it. I could do a part of it. Um, the other aspect is, would anyone know what I'm saying? Well, I, I mean, I as I said, I can understand Spanish. I can't necessarily speak it, but I can understand Spanish. Ruben is semi-fluent in Spanish. Um, okay. so he can actually speak it and understand it. He just doesn't do it very often. And okay. we, have, we do have other trainers. Like what I've done in the past, if we have trainers around, that we have four bilingual trainers right now. So I will um, ask one of those to jump on the Hangout or jump on, you know, hey, could you jump in for this? Um, okay. So that's, that's where we're at with that. I was actually going to ask you too, when Lorena does her final presentation, she would like to do it in Spanish as well as English. So I wanted to see, I was trying to find people that,